I'm a pressure player. What does that mean? That means that the one place, even from the very beginning as a kid who felt so very insignificant and empty and was real hard on myself, um, something when I got on stage was like, it just, it felt like I'm in real time when everywhere else I feel like very out of sorts and very kind of lonely or a wallflower or no timing. Mm. Um, and I think I got that from my dad, uh, athleticism, mm. ready for the ball. Give me the ball, and in that moment, and it was the one place that I, I didn't, I didn't break my confidence. But in my personal life, I went through a real like, a real topsy turvy time, not feeling like, oh man, I, I thought by breaking through it would bring all the kids in the schoolyard to love me. Hi, right, welcome back, everybody. I'm fired up. I'm trying to get this guy on for a couple years. And uh, we kind of went back and forth on some DMs over some time. I've been a fan of his for a long time, all the way back to the MySpace days. And he is, he's just, let's just be real, he's one of the most prolific stand-ups of all time, which ended up becoming acting and all kinds of other stuff that he's been successful at. And then he's just got this special out right now called Above It All, that you can get at danecook.com. And I watched the other night, and I'm like, hey, he's even more brilliant than he was before. It's hilarious. But it's really inspiring and motivating at the same time. To me, that's good art. It gave me more than one emotion at one time. It wasn't just giggling and laughing. It moved me, and it made me think. And so I got a legend sitting across from me. Dane Cook, welcome to the show. Wow, man. That was like the wind-up, and I was holding my breath. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is a... – thanks for having me on, and thanks for uh, the flowers, man. I'm deeply proud of this moment. Yeah, you should be. You. Um, what made you – I know you get asked this a lot, but like – he, just so you guys know, you're going to go watch it. It's, it's, you're the best storyteller I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. No, you are the best storyteller. And I've never watched like an hour go by with sort of just a few stories. And right. like, it feels sort of like one long bit. That's exactly what it feels yeah. like. Was that with intent or does, when you put your, you know, I, I have a lot of stand up friends that kind of say, I got good 20 minutes right now. I'm working right. on the other 20. I'm working on the hook. I'm sure. Did you, was that intentional to go that way? Yeah, I think a lot of the stand-up that I loved growing up was the wrong moments, the off-kilter moments, the moments that seemingly were like, oh, man, that's the that's the end of that rhythm. I actually like, example, um, before The Tonight Show was uh, Fallon, growing up it was Johnny Carson. He was mm -hmm. the Fallon. Yeah. And Johnny Carson could deliver the material, but when something went clunk, he came to life mm. and you saw something happen in the room and you felt it that was uh, you couldn't take your eyes off him in that moment and and it was like can he get back to the laugh and of course yeah. he would yeah and so i think i always looked at stand-up as i'm never going to be a perfect stand-up comedian i'm never going to master this there is no uh end game to stand up mm. i I'd, I'd been a student of it enough to know but if you're an, a person who evolves their philosophy grows up with a generation of fans and can kind of take the piss out of yourself and in yeah. those Johnny Carson type moments, yeah. uh, reflect on it in real time. If mm -hmm. you get that good, then I think that's where comedy can be storytelling and you don't really see the beginning, middle and end. Yeah, I also think it takes like tons of, I'll call it guts since this is a clean show, but like I speak for a living, right? So well, I don't know for a living, but it's one of the things I do. To go that long on a story means you got a lot of confidence where you're taking me because if it doesn't hit, you've taken eight or ten minutes up of the show that doesn't hit so <laughs> right that takes some real stuff right sure. to do that do you... and it takes a lot of time not getting quite to the where it... the end point is yeah there's you know it's kind of the cul-de-sac moment once in a while i call it where you go well this is lovely but where does this go <laughs> yeah, right right and so the pieces that you see if i if i do my job the way i i hope i presented it here is like i'm gonna sandbox each story mm. and we're going to find something that we call in comedy i'm sure you've heard it from your other comedy buddies is lpms mm. laughs per minute mm. and if i can fill a story out and i know where i want to take you but i can hit those laughs it's not a seminar or a monologue it's stand up oh very good yeah what made you do it at your house uh a few reasons mm. um well first and foremost when i moved in there 12 years ago i it's a baller pad by the way it's Movies a it's good. a beautiful He's, spot yeah and it's overlooking and it's just it looks like a treasure trove out there it's it's yep. glistening and i stood on my porch 12 years ago uh, i went through probably one of the most difficult moments of my life where i'd been come out of uh, a hardship a financial hardship and i almost didn't even know if i could keep my house i was in mm, such I dire straits mm. 
But I stood on the porch and I was like, not only am I going to work my ass off to um, mm. my butt off, sorry, okay. uh, to 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 keep this place, but it feels like a stage up here. Mm. And I already had been formulating the idea, and where that came from was, I don't know how it was out here, but East Coast, you had somebody stoop. You had a weekend night, you had a few drinks, and you had neighbors congregating and stories flying and impersonations of each other. And yeah. next thing you know, it was like, it felt like a little makeshift show on, on, a, on a front porch. Yeah. And I loved that. And I wanted to recreate that. You did that out of that. So I want to go there. It's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Sure. You see someone like you, you've had this, like, your voice is tripping me out because in the old days when you had like an iPod, like the thing that when you would turn it on, the same thing would pop up. Your comedy special popped up for like four years ago. I actually got very sick of you because I was like, click off this guy. Like, I kept hearing your damn voice in this. It was like, what was it alphabetically? One of my bits was like yes, the first one the that, first like, thing. abduction bit or yeah, whatever it, it was, was like abdu- aliens. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. The aliens one. How A lot you, of people wrote me that and said how that. How the hell do you know? Oh, because it's with an A. Because people why. would tell me, you're the first thing on my Dude, shuffle. I've heard that bit, no exaggeration, over 3,000 times. I apologize. I'm I know. Sorry. Like, it's really good, but it ain't 3,000 times. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth worth uh, 3,000 plays, but it was a funny bit. So having you on here, but I also <laughs> I w- was very much a fan of your work, and so I know about what you're describing. So people see the successful life of anybody that's on my show, and the backstory, like, we'll get to how you started and what you overcame, but in the, in the throes of your career, mm. after you've worked your ass off traveling around, busting your tail, someone very close to you, yeah. I mean, this is an incredible incredible amount of adversity and story so tell them what happened yeah, i well, want to know i grew up with a half brother mm-hmm. in the same household so felt like just like a, a brother mm-hmm. right and he ended up coming and working for me as my bookkeeper mm-hmm. so what started off as a young kid you know paying my chevy cavalier once a month bill and yeah. you know maybe like a couple of slices of pizza that i charged on my you know arlington credit card mm-hmm turned into something you know much more lucrative and unfortunately what i did not know yeah, your was face just changed he mm-hmm. he was uh you know it, i guess the joke would be like was he double dipping and it's like what's that times 50 wow. he was just you know he was taking mm-hmm. and it was real nefarious mm-hmm. and it left me in a place where all those years of 16 years to become an overnight sensation not only did it hit the reset button but it was like i have nothing in the till I'm quite literally, you know, trying to figure out, like, it was fascinating because you, because I was like, I still have my creativity. Mm -hmm. I still have this fan base, but I don't have the monetization Mm -hmm. to just do whatever I want in this moment. It was almost like kind of weirdly starting over in the middle of my career. I call it the Empire Strikes Back saga of my life and career because it got dark. And it got so, he, he was incarcerated. Yeah. Oh yeah. He went to prison for... Eight, eight years. Did you all just hear that? Maria Menounos is telling me she's driving with you in Boston. She's like, oh, yeah, my brother's there. And, like, you literally drove by where he was. That's right. He was at Middlesex County Jail, which I think now is torn down. It might be a hotel. But wow. at the time, he was, you know, probably peeking out a little window in that, in wow. that jail. In the Huskow. And that's the time that you're saying you conceived of this vision for what now I'm seeing in your special? Or the, well, the he was with me at the house. He was with me when I first was buying the house. And I didn't know that I really didn't have the ability. But he was telling me, yeah, 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 you're, you're good. And whatever he was doing away from the porch that day was like preparing for his getaway as I was <laughs> preparing to, wow. to buy my dream house, not knowing that I just, yeah, no, I was not uh, solvent in that uh, moment to be able to, to do that. Yeah, because you bring... You have a unique, even when you walk in the room, like you light it up. You have a really special energy. You have a success energy, or whatever that is. I could you probably call it charisma. You have that, and it's special, and you know it when you see it in somebody. But as I like dove into you, my admiration for you really grew. I'm like, this dude has constantly had to overcome all kinds of stuff, <laughs> like all, like really heavy stuff. And in the special, I was moved by many things. But your face also changes in the special. Like, I watched it twice, mm. and you tell the story about that Chevy Cavalier, by the way. I, I really watched, man. I love that okay. car. And you, you get this gig, and I think it's in Florida. That's right. And it's not paid. And you go, yeah, I'll go do it. And I don't want to tell the whole special away, but I just, We call it a hell gig now. The these, are the, these are the, If you like comedy hell gig stories, yeah. then mine was either going to break me or, uh, you know, uh, it incite me you know but everyone listen to this show everyone if you're listening to my stuff you want to do something great with your life you're either doing it or you're trying to do it and 
and you are going to have your version of this maybe multiple times. Right. And then the crazy thing is, then you may even get there and have it taken like you did. There's, That's right. But could and, you sh- and, and not only that, but you may get knocked down and get up and get knocked down and get up and then get knocked down and get up. It's <laughs> like, it isn't just a metronome rhythm of like, oh, if I take a knock, sometimes you can take a lot of knocks. A lot of them. And yeah. you've taken them. And I always say the difference between winning and losing is so small in life, in sports. We're talking football before we went on here. Yeah. It's almost too scary to look at. <laughs> and you were this close to going, I'm out. Actually, you did say it. So, for sure. could you tell them a little version of what happened there, like with the hot dogs? And yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. To I, me. So I tell this bit about it's called the Wrath Skeller, and uh, if you end up listening to it, uh, everyone actually, listen. Yeah, Go it's gonna listen. it's it's gonna be on Spotify as well too. So the album yeah. will be everywhere. But if I would I would love for you to see the special because I think aesthetically what Marty Culner did as my director is absolutely lovely. But it is. the bit is centered around when you're so when you're a comedian on the come up. Um, you know, there's no, there's no um, dental, there's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no support, there's no union, there's no nothing, and you just take these gigs sometimes that are, they might be, you know, the middle of nowhere would make these gigs seem interesting. You know, you're mm-hmm. talking about places that seem like kind of insignificant, but it matters to get out on the road and build that fan base. So mm-hmm. I tell the story of a a humiliating, uh, bludgeoning. Oh gosh ego destroying maybe even ego defining if we wanted to get into psychology of it all um moment very early in my career where i was hired to do a gig at this place called the wrath skeller from boston i drove to florida the story i tell is probably a condensed version of a 24 48 hours of my life where i was really rethinking everything mm-hmm. you know putting it out really in front of me and i'm sure you've had these great yeah. minutia conversations where you're really getting into beyond the nitty-gritty you're into the plankton of it all yeah. and you're going i do not have what it takes right now to mm-hmm. see this through yeah and to relinquish your power in that moment and know it's okay to know i don't have it all yeah. i don't i don't but Maybe from that, I can recognize the pockets, the holes, the voids, mm-hmm. and start getting the education and information to fill those things in. Mm-hmm. But you need, to, you need to have it almost like break apart and crack apart yeah. and break you in order to go, oh, yeah, this is life. This is life. Identifying that, yeah. that um, void and going, I need material in there, not you yeah. know, comedy material. I need, I need stuff in there you know, to... It, um, uh, ad- adhesive yes for the dreams around it to come to fruition he basically quits and then like a few minutes later goes no i'm not out Seriously. don't tell the whole ending no, i want I want, <laughs> I, want I want them to see it but i mean the the thing about i'm kidding it's my, not the actual my, ending it's not the ending there's a little bit more after that but <laughs> my dad was an alcoholic and when he got sober <laughs> I finally got sober. I said, Daddy, are you never going to drink again? He goes, mm, I can't tell you that. I'm just not going to drink for one more day. Mm-hmm. And when I was an entrepreneur, it reminds me of the story in the, well, I am an entrepreneur, but when I was struggling, right. which I still struggle sometimes, but when I was really struggling, I called my dad. I'm like, I don't have what it takes. Verbatim what you just said. I said the words. Mm-hmm. I don't have what it takes. I'm just not like these other guys. I'm just, I don't know. Like I, I want it, but I don't think I want it like they do or, wow. or there's something missing in me. I'm going to quit. Wow, wow. And, and my dad goes, uh, I go, Dad, I can't decide. I just want to do this forever. My dad goes, well, you don't have to. He goes, just don't quit for one more day. Mm. I just didn't quit that day. Mm. You know what I mean? I just didn't yeah. quit that day. And then the next day, kind of the emotion started to wear off, and my strength came back. And many, sure. many times, I'm like, I'm just not going to quit for today. You needed to be depleted. You almost needed yeah. to run your battery out completely Yeah. to feel that feeling. Have you had that? Like yeah. multiple times? You say, like, I've heard you say, like, what you just said about the void or, like, that space. Like, that's where you've got all your info. Right when you've at the end of something and failures where you've gathered most of your info yes. that's made you successful. Yeah, something about being completely a- annihilated sometimes emotionally. I think where you come back from that and start to recognize, or for me was, I don't need to do this the way that I think success is derived from i need to do my version of this and take it to where my success will be jeez and that was definitive in that breakdown side of the road moment Mm. what i say now and kind of the way i put it together and what i think is kind of an interesting sound bite is like when you're at your rock bottom i try to tell people don't be so fast to come up for air don't don't get the hell out of there so quick take a beat look around 
accept that you're in this rock bottom moment because there's so much data and failure. There's so much wealth of information in hitting that lowest moment that when you finally come to the surface, those are gems that you've brought up with you. And you only get them at your most broken, down at the bottom moment where you're not just on one knee, you're down on both trying to figure out like which end is up. You need it. Oh, you need that. Thank you. We could stop right now. Like, thank you for that. Like, I've had five, I've done about 500 shows. I've had five people who aren't in what I'd call the self-help motivational field. Five right. that I've said this to. You should be doing this in addition to oh. what you do. No, no, no. Not because you need the money, because you don't. Because you'd really help humanity with it. Mm. Let me tell you who they are. It's interesting. Jim Rome, the radio broadcaster, has yeah. become a dear friend of mine, and he's starting to. Ironically, David Arnold, David A. Arnold, who you and I were just yeah. talking about, who sat in the seat you're in several weeks ago and is no longer with us. Um, I said that to Leanne Rimes about three hours ago. Okay. <laughs> it was just here. Oh. It was one other I'm forgetting, and you. Mm. I think that's the four, and it's you. And I've thought this about you for years as I've watched you. I've watched you on different things, and I've, here's how I know. I'll rewind and listen to you say it again. I've watched you in various different things. I went, I want to watch, even the special. I didn't, I, it, I laughed the whole time, but that's not why I watched it again. I watched it again because I wanted to be moved by a few of the stories in there. Right. It's particularly like your, and it's not just what you said. It's like even with you right now, even though this is mainly audio, like your face. When you said your brother, your face changed. Right. When you said that story, your face changed. So it's at that place. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is I know you've dealt with anxiety. And I heard you say something like, there's a fine line between anxiety and something else. Right, excitement. Man, I live this. So I think you say it way better than I can say it, and I'm the one in this space. So say it. What is it? Yeah, man, it was a a eureka moment in my, uh, I had never done therapy as an adult. And after my, I'd lost both my parents to cancer within the same year. Around the time this stuff happened with your brother. Two, well, it was two years before. Yeah. So I lo- lose both my folks, and I'm still in Sorry about running. That. Oh, thank yeah. you, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. They, you know, I was from that moment, I was um, in like run and gun moment, probably for a lot of reasons. I was, I was not ready to accept that, you know, my mom was my best friend. Mm. So it was like, I was not ready. I'd, I'd grown a great relationship with my father also mm. uh, out of alcoholism. Mm. And we finally figured it out. It took mm. us the last like eight years of his life. Mm. So I lose my folks. I'm still racing because I'm in this uh, high watermark moment. Mm. Got the stuff that happens with my brother. Then the career starts to come down off yep. of it's like the echelon. Apex. And all that's happening at the same time. And I finally realized I don't know how to be sad. My dad was an athlete. I've got broad shoulders, but my mom was very phobic and very sensitive. I got the anxiety. Mm -hmm. I got a um, heart of my sleeve kind of thing. And all of those things mushed together was like, I'm a guy that wants to put win in the win column, right? Like the dad. Yep. But I'm mostly like a very sensitive Mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. No instruction to how to grieve and to how to accept like you made it and it's going to hurt because you're going to fall. It's going to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, sitting across from a therapist one day and talking about like anxiety and how I cope, you know, put the feet on the floor and I, you know, you rub the top of your legs and you put the tongue on the (laughs) roof of your mouth and eight Mm -hmm. seconds in breathing. I knew all 17 minutes, if I can make it through, you know, I knew all the, the, you know, the tricks, the life hacks. And he said to me, do you ever think that maybe uh, in one of those moments where you're feeling really scared that you're actually anticipating? And I, I said, almost like there's a fine line between my anxiety and excitement and he said nothing but when i said it it was like meeting myself yeah i recognized something in me that was like more apparent than even some of the other things i'd put on to show people yeah and it was in that moment when i walked out of there that i i subscribed to that and i started to investigate hey you know what maybe there are times in my life where i'm not scared but i'm fooling myself into thinking I am and why is because I think a lot of people, and I'm sure some of your listeners will understand, knowing you're going to succeed is scary. Yeah. Mm. And it's hard to go in what I said on the Burt Kreischer podcast. Mm-hmm. It's hard to say, I'm going to win. Mm-hmm. It's scary to say that. It's mm-hmm. really putting yourself out there. Mm-hmm. But you know, mm-hmm. and I know, that when you're feeling it, you have to... You got to run for the touchdown. You get like, yeah. if you were in sports, you'd be like, give me the ball. Yep. Yep. And I don't know why in society, I think we're in this place where it's not always 
um, we're not always allowing ourselves to so to say that person's they're they're in a they're sparkling. Yes. And like let's let them have it. Yeah. Let's let them go. We don't have to equalize all the time. Sometimes. Yeah. You feel behind everybody, and that's okay to feel like mm-hmm. I can't keep up. And sometimes you're ahead. Mm-hmm. And in anxiety and excitement, I started to learn. I have to identify if I'm anxious. I need to be able to tell you and say to you, hey, man, I'm feeling like a little scared today. I'm feeling like and be able to do that. Yes. But I also need to be able to say to you, man, I'm really gung ho. Yeah, I'm can... really feeling it. And now I can separate those two things. Yeah. And it's easier to co- compartmentalize my reaction to those things because I, I know better who I am from them. It's the best thing I've ever heard, man. Like I in my first book, I call them the butterfly moments of life. Yeah, when I was. I got butterflies when some dude wanted to beat me up on the playground. <laughs> right. And I got butterflies when I thought I was going to get a home run yes. baseball game. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And I've learned that in those butterfly moments, I've identified them as the butterfly moment is the universe, God's way of going. Something real special could happen right now. Mm. And I've actually, a lot, like when I go speak, if it's a big stage, there's 15,000 people, I get the butterflies. These go, I'm scared. Right. I'm scared. Now I go, I think I'm excited. Yeah, that's right. But I didn't use the word excited until I saw you say it. Right. But to me, I call my first book, I call them these butterfly moments. I also don't want to live a life with no butterfly moments. Mm. You're engaged. Yeah. At some point, this sounds corny, but she gave you those. That's right. Maybe she still does. In fact, I think sometimes how you know it's the one is the butterflies continue past the first or second date. Great identifiers of where you're supposed to be. Isn't it? Yeah. So that thing, that anxiety thing that we call anxiety or fear, a lot of things with parenting is caught, not taught. Mm. Like, I didn't turn out like my dad. But we do inherit our parents' emotions a lot. Right. Maybe not their behaviors, maybe not their career, but we do inherit their emotions. My dad, till the day he died, he was a stud, but he would always say, I'm 45 years old. We have a great conversation. Hey, be careful. He would finish every call, every meeting. Hey, be careful. Be- what the f- am I being careful about all the time? <laughs> what right. is, it's, it's in, embedding in me, there's lots of things to be afraid of yeah, in life. Right. But you don't do that as a parent intentionally. But it happens. So I just, I just think it's like that's well, it, why I tell you you should be doing this. It's like well, I, you know, and I do. I mean, it, it is in my stand up. I mean, part of it, it like is. it's like I've, I've figured out a way to like, um, not shield a real emotion, even though there's comedy happening around it. Yeah. So there are definitely parts in the performance where, um, I like to say now, like, um, I didn't expect that. Mm-hmm. I'll perform something, and it's not just all the show. Mm-hmm. And I will say. Uh, sometimes I'll laugh at something, and my my joke to that is, um, sorry to be laughing. Uh, some of the stuff I'm hearing for the first time as well, yeah. and I like uh, that I'm cultivating a the next incarnation of my stand up career. That it, it's it's you're, I'm not there to try to teach. I'm not, mm-hmm. but I am trying to teach you about me. And if my experiences help you, then you're laughing and you're also getting a little bit of that data that I'm talking about. That's really good. Yeah, that's. Really I love good. that you talk. You know, it's like when you talk about your dad, you made me recognize. Um, like thinking about the the information and sometimes the misinformation that you know we get from our parents mm-hmm. you know from being you know encaved in the in the household and in a sponge mode of what we see and what we absorb and yet isn't it it's 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 interesting that sometimes i think maybe as men and and mm-hmm. i'm just you know not trying to narrow it but maybe maybe men and women but i think sometimes as men like we take those things that we think um are the signs of being a provider or being a and with my dad i was fortunate to have my mom always in my ear and saying be the best parts of him Mm. remember to be the best parts of him Mm. and it was a good little nugget that i hope that i can impart which is like Yes. Not all of what I am is what it, what you need to be. Yeah. If you see, if you identify great traits in me, give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Those flex might inform yeah. you. But you don't have to be me. And you don't have to be what my life is. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have more fun being able to watch you. And I don't know if our dads or my dad mm-hmm. really knew how to um, articulate that. No, my dad definitely didn't. <laughs> but I'd like to think. By the way, I just made me feel good about myself. I actually think I have some of. I'm giving myself a compliment. I, I think I took some of my dad's. My dad had great things about him. I think I did. By the way, everyone listening to this, you know the key thing in listening to our show is the application of the information. Mm-hmm. So when he says something like he just said that's so beautifully profound and unique, what's the application for you? Maybe it's taking the best thing from your children that are struggling right now. What's the best things about mm-hmm. them? Emphasize those things. They could build their entire life around those things rather than focusing on their, they're not good at math in school and you're constantly beating them up about their math scores. Maybe they're exceptional at 
geography right, or right. history Something or else. reading or and writing. And they're showing you in that moment, this is not my strength. Right. So don't make me have to right. work that muscle. Let's if get through my, that, but right. let's, let's go to my strength. Like, I... I was terrible at math, thank God my, what if I had spent my whole life trying to get good at math that has nothing to do with anything I do for <laughs> right. a living right now. Speaking of- Do you incarn- know what the best yeah. advice your dad ever gave you was? Whether it was on purpose or not, does that, does something yeah. come to mind? Yeah, it does. I know the worst and I know the best. Mm-hmm. So the worst was he told me not to go into the business and it ultimately made me you know, pretty wealthy. So that was bad advice. Okay. <laughs> but um, my, this may sound super corny, but my dad taught me to not, my dad was very liberal and a beautiful part of him was not to ever judge somebody that you don't know what the cross they're bearing. Mm. So that my dad was that dude that no matter how drunk he got or whatever he did, if there's a home, everyone's getting money if they're homeless, everyone's getting something we gave there. I would, I, I'm not a highly judgmental person because of my dad. I love I all people because of my dad. But when even when someone would misbehave or be rude or me, my dad would go, you don't know what they're going through. You just don't know. And I've been pretty good at pausing in my uh, life to do that. What about yeah. yours? Oh boy. Um, he had a few gems, but I think the one that always stays with me is he once said, well, he said, actually, too, he said one time, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. In other words, like building up my fan base early on, Ooh. nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. I think we were walking through like Faneuil Hall and we saw a few people like getting ready to watch somebody entertain and maybe do like some acrobatics or mm-hmm. and he, he turned to me and said, just remember that nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. Mm-hmm. So I took that early on, but he also said something and I, I know he didn't intend for this to be as... Um, instrumental he once said to me um you should do more college gigs this is when i was like first starting sure. around boston Those were good pieces and, <laughs> but early college gigs really no money like okay. you show up at a cafeteria oh. and you're like you know you're like uh fodder for while oh. they're eating their snacks and then okay. you look up and there's a comedian there but he said you should do a lot of college gigs and i was trying to be a club comic i thought mm-hmm. that's that was mm-hmm. the cool road yeah mm-hmm. and i said why do you think i should do a lot of college gigs and he said i believe the things that you discover in your college years are the things that you take with you for the rest of your life Mm. and you want to keep close in other words like Mm. the happiest memories of maybe what he looked at as maybe some of the best times of his life in the prime of his life and to go oh wow if you always have that group um then you might always be able to pay the bills because that's a group that will want to Mm. grow with you and so that's when i started saying i want to grow up i want to grow with a a generation of comedy fans. I don't know if I'll take it beyond. I don't know where I'm going to go, but I do know I want to grow up with this generation of college four years. You were that intentional about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was like, man, I, I at 15, I felt like I was already... I, I liked I was watching Oprah every day with my mom and having deep discussions about, like, why are these people behaving and why that philosophy? And I was... I, the key to comedy, curiosity. And I was a curious kid. I was curious about even why I was the way I was. And uh-huh. so I always kept that. Leanne Rimes was sitting right here two hours ago yeah. and said, the key is curiosity. Oh, wow. So okay. this success leaves clues. By the way, I watched Oprah too. Now I have a show that's like that called Change, my own show. Yeah. Same thing. I'd ask my own. Quick right. plug. Where do I get to uh, experience On that? Nosy. Okay. On Nosy. <laughs> on Nosy right now. Thank you. <laughs> Streaming on Nosy. Um, Speaking of incarnations of you and your intention, so you all know who Dane Cook is, but you may not know how you know Dane Cook. You were the first, I mean, like real pioneering on branding, on social, on MySpace. Was that intentional? And what would you say to someone who is social brand reliant right mm. now? Any any tips on building one and any yes. warnings about doing one? I'll tell you the, the key. Because this is the king the right key, here. The key then and the key now, even though, yes, there's algorithms and there's maybe corporate entities and there's, you know, trends and th- there's a lot of um, malarkey. Uh, what worked for me 20 years ago and what I now like to say, it was TikTok 1.0, yeah. which was MySpace, yep. the first kind of real, that and Facebook, yep. is as true today, even though there's a lot of noise and distraction. And what worked for me 20 years ago that didn't work for several other comedians and maybe some musician friends was they'd set up a page and they had cool stuff on it, but you have to have soul. Mm. Even in the digital realm, mm. you got to have soul. You got to figure out how can I put some real heart and soul into this static page with some videos or some cool font or whatever, however your um, aesthetic, however you present, you can make it look fancy schmancy but you got to put some truth in there. Mm-hmm. That's what resonates with people more than anything else. Even if it's absurd truth, even if it's like uh, irreverent truth, if you're speaking your truth, mm-hmm. you will find you'll, you're polarizing. Mm-hmm. 
And that's good because you'll have definitively person on one side say, I love this. Mm. And then you'll definitively have somebody on the other side that can't stop watching you because the truth is an aphrodisiac. And they want to come in and they want to point counterpoint with the people on that side. You, you, you want that. So if you don't have heart and soul in your, in your, in your space, mm-hmm. then you're going to see the numbers languishing. You need that. Okay. Is there a danger in it? In other words, was there a part of you that goes, I'm yeah. glad I did it? I mean, you probably would not the be The danger is derivative. Meaning? Meaning don't be derivative. When you're going to see something that works once, God, and unless you're in the, in the business of making one red hat with one green feather, mm-hmm. uh, and that's all you make, and that's the, that's the aesthetic, then you're going to pigeonhole yourself quick. And so I think with truth, because truth is ever-changing, and you're ever-changing, and as a person you're ever-changing, your experiences, mm-hmm. be that in the digital realm so good Dave. allow people in even when it's like like oh this yeah. this is it's hard to give your power to people like yes. I, you know we i know that yeah. you've talked about like yeah. you give your power to somebody else and man it's it's terrifying yes because like what are you going to do how are you going to hurt me the inner child in me the mm-hmm. person that you know you know i have failed you know what broke me in my career you could easily mm-hmm. hit that switch mm-hmm. and bring a lot of things that make me want to regurgitate Gosh. but but because i own all of it you can't hurt me with it because i accept my truth i accept all the bad things happen to me which is the conclusion of in your page in your digital presentation if you're not derivative if you can stay um present zen how whatever you call mm-hmm. it nothing's ever falling apart it's only falling together <laughs> adopt that keep that and be truthful and love what you're doing in there and that's going to give your page soul and if you have soul people swing through hang out with you every interview we do when i'm listening to someone talk i go okay that'll be the social media clip the, I <laughs> no, but, yeah, dude, i'm so psyched it's like minority you report I mean? you're editing yes. and seeing i love that the man. Two problem is i don't mean I to be blowing that. smoke at you like every damn thing you've said so far would be the clip like i'm serious like every have you always been your iq this high have you always been this i don't know what my iq is i just know that like i am a passionate person and sometimes Sometimes I ramble, but I'm, I am, my curiosity has led to some definitive understanding at, at now 50 years old. I, I, I want to just be straight up, no nonsense, 24 mm. 7. So you got me on a good day. Yeah. Because I, if I, I came like... in here feeling like downtrodden, yeah. I say, man, I need some pick me up today. Yeah. Maybe you have the advice that yeah. I don't have, yeah. but like I'm going to listen more than I am going to jabber. Yeah. Well, you know? I'm glad that I, well, I would take you on either day, brother. And I'm here for you on those days, by the way. I mean that too. I, you're moving me so speaking of that like opening yourself up to criticism this man became hated to some extent um and even by peers that were jealous you know i've had i won't i've had mutual friends of ours tell me you know what i feel bad i didn't like that dude for years and then i got to know him he's a wonderful guy (laughs) right right you know what i'm saying i've had those but like you, you moved so far in front of the line yeah. So there's all these dudes that went off putting. It was off putting. They well, people went the traditional whatever that was, and you found a path that was yours. To right. Everything you just said, you did. That's why it's so powerful. What he just described, he did. The thing he said earlier about success being looking one way, this is the success my way. Yeah. So he found his way, and he just went boom. He's filling arenas up, and there's these guys that are great comics, but they're still doing That's clubs right. for 150 people. And you you took a lot of criticism, right? And even in your special, I don't want to especially you even say, I don't, I shouldn't Google myself. Right. So how, how, how did it impact you then? And yeah. how should yeah. someone deal yeah. with criticism, hate, oh, those things? Now, this, it, it, you have a master class on man, this. Man, uh, how PhD. did I deal with it then? Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, man. It was, um, there was a lot of pain mm. because I just wanted acceptance. I was mm. still the kid who... You know, I told you I was like running, running, running. Like success had me like on a tear. And then after a little bit, I remember exactly what the moment was or realizing, oh my goodness, like I'm more that kid than I ever was before. And all this success and all the adulation and all the good stuff that comes with it, um, you know, nothing was ever going to fill the yeah. the void. Larry Moss is a great acting instructor. Yeah. I had an opportunity to, uh-huh. to have a seminar with him, a private one-on-one. Mm-hmm. And he said something that was just so prolific. He said, um, he said, talk to me a little bit about the the void, the, the, the hole that you feel inside of you. Mm-hmm. And I, at first I was kind of like, you know, yeah. 
I didn't expect that we're going to go there in an acting seminar. I don't know. I said, I don't don't really know what you mean. And he kept on me, kept on me. And they finally said, um, you know, that emptiness that you feel that you take with you from when you're a kid. He said, what would happen if you stopped trying to cover it with things? What would happen if you stopped trying to keep it behind you? And what would happen if you showed people that void? Mm. What would happen? Mm -hmm. And I went on stage that night and I started I started the show in a way that I never had, which was, I'm going to tell people at the very beginning when I greet everybody how I truly feel. Again, that thing about soul and, yeah. and truthfulness, because then the rest of the act is going to take on a different um, vibe, because now yeah. you know when I said, hey, everybody, I hope you're having a good night. I'm having a rough day, and I could get into it. Like Whether I did or didn't, I'm starting with an instant moment of truth. Yeah, I'm not putting on a facade. Yeah. It's not showman. Da 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 da. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you something real. And I think from from that moment when backlash started to happen, my f- initial feeling was I was in such pain because I wanted the acceptance, and I think I thought that show business or specifically comedy was going to be like athletics. You know, athleticism. My dad was you know into so many sports, and I thought when you win, maybe it's going to feel like. You win for everybody. Mm. And I thought I was winning for everybody. Mm. I thought when I broke down that, that uh, digital realm yeah, the that, I was, I would, that I would say, hey, I know, um, you know I was kind of a geek to be sitting at home doing all this stuff, toiling on the internet. But hey, I think I broke the code to help all of us. Yeah. And it wasn't received that way. It was received from a lot of people in hindsight who would share with me like, man, I'd be on the road and all morning DJs would say is like, why don't you be like Dane Cook? Mm -hmm. And it was me saying like, don't try to be my success when I was saying like, Mm -hmm. you know, you realize your success isn't the path that you Mm -hmm. think you need to be on. It's taking that and making a unique path. Mm -hmm. Well, I was that unique path that other people were being told do what he's doing and mm-hmm. that that didn't sit well with a lot of people it didn't brother yeah. did you did it affect your confidence not on stage i'm a pressure player what does that mean that means that the one place even from the very beginning as a kid who felt so very insignificant and empty and was real hard on myself um something when i got on stage was like it just it felt like I'm in real time when mm-hmm. everywhere else I feel like very out of sorts and very kind of lonely or a wallflower or mm-hmm. no timing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I got that from my dad. Uh, mm-hmm. Athleticism, mm-hmm. ready for the ball. Give yeah. me the ball. And in that moment, and mm-hmm. it was the one place that I, I didn't, it didn't break my confidence. But in my personal life, I went through a real like a real topsy turvy time, not feeling like oh man I. I thought by breaking through it would bring all the kids in the schoolyard to love me. Mm-hmm. I think that like mm-hmm. when you're on stage or you're doing something you're called to do or great at, it's a moment of like full presence and you don't have the um, luxury of worrying about all these external things. It's yeah. like when I'm speaking on stage, like I'm, you have to be fully present when you're there. Right. And I think somehow the other stuff, all my insecurities sort of disappear in those moments. Yet the minute I walk off, like the minute I walk off, yes. how did I do? How did I do? I'm back to being that kid again. Love me. Tell me I did well. Was that okay? What did I screw up? Right. I don't know. Do you do that when you get off stage? I'm very insecure when I'm finished. When I step off stage, almost immediately, my heart rate starts to decrease. I have a really good resting heart rate, by the way. It's like 65 all the time. Okay, that's good. And I step off stage, and by the time I get from the stage, at, this is like this even in arenas. By okay. the time I'd get for off stage 20,000 people and was in my dressing room, my tea was ready with a little honey and i'm very chill and i'm zen because i i know it's like i'm back to being that regular human being i never chased the party after i never needed that adulation after the you show didn't? never i used to watch you thinking this dude's so good looking every walks when dane walks out it's like woo, it like, was crazy crazy yeah, and, and, and a like, lot of women and yeah, a lot of and like, like that this thing, dude the is going <laughs> ballistic the minute he walks off the stage that was not true well i was i was probably having at it in the after party yeah, with my yeah, friends yeah. but as far as like i never needed the adulation the high yeah, the, of the stage yeah. is something that i know is only in one place and i don't try to look for it or find it anywhere else and it's just right there okay if i'm pursuing a dream i'm listening to dane cook right as someone who achieved his dream right and I ask a lot of people this. By the way, everyone listening, are you starting to see a theme with successful people that are on the show all the time? Did you hear what he just said about there's this void I'm trying to fill? There's these insecure. Have you, 
Are you seeing a theme here? Here's the theme. They're you. They sound a lot like you, don't they, when you get them behind a microphone and they're not on stage and they're in an environment where they can tell the truth. They've had adversity. They've had haters. They've had setbacks. They've had insecurities. They've had strange upbringings. They've had people around them hurt them. They deal with the emotions you deal with, the fear and anxiety. Isn't this interesting? They're you. And the reason it's so important that you accept that is because if they were superhuman, that would give you a cop out to not making your dream come true. But because now you know they're just like you, there's no excuse for you not to make your dream come true. That's why, like, some of this hero worship stuff that you get when you go out or I get, I, it's enjoyable to feel. But there's a part of me that's like, I'm not any different than you, and I don't want you to think it because that gives you an excuse not to win. Now, what I'm wondering about you is... By the way, I said nothing because that's the clip from the show, dude. <laughs> no, no, that was like... Uh, yeah, man, that was it right there. I don't want Beautiful. that for people. Now, Beautiful. I'm curious, though. You caught your dream. Be honest about this, please. I know you've been honest the whole time, but like, this is a hard one to be honest about. Okay. Was it or is it what you thought it would be and or slash worth it? It's what I thought it would be where... In the rare air moments of success, when you see something hit that like plateau that you're like, man, this is exceeding my expectations. And I always set high expectations. Mm -hmm. Where it meets it for me is how you can give back when you have that light on you is awesome. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part of fame when I'm in a moment where it's like, the, you know, the ebb versus the flow is when I feel important, I get to make other people feel important. And to be able to like, for example, like when I first broke through and I could do stuff with Boston Children's Hospital, a place that I was when I was four years old, they helped me through some stuff. And to be able to go like, oh, now I get to take some of that light and illuminate over there. That's the best part. When you're not in a famous moment and you're not getting invited to those things, for me, where I go to is not like, oh, I'm not in vogue. Where I go to is like, I feel like if I make it better right now, I could help more people. Mm -hmm. And so that's always a driving factor for me. So when I, when I met fame... Yeah. Um, yes, all the, the fun and the cool factor in like, you know, rubbing elbows with my heroes and most of them being cool. I don't mm -hmm. think I met too many people that like, so for a number of reasons, I can say definitively, like if, when you're charging towards success, when you get there, a lot of what you hope for it to be can and will be there. Mm. Then there's some prickly parts and there's some bad contracts and stuff that in business are going to be like a little bit of like yeah. a poo poo moment yep. but for the most part love the the experience of being kind of in that inner circle okay and you what about tying your identity to it meaning inevitably there's peaks and plateaus and valleys and right. everything in life there's your we're gonna talk about your relationship in a minute if you don't mind for a second but in relation i've been in a long relationship there's peaks and valleys and right. plateaus in careers in money in notoriety and these other things and i think it's how you deal with oftentimes with the valleys of your life that really will probably determine the quality of it. Sure. And so you had this meteoric rise, like anything, at some point it's not going to continue to go on an upward trajectory. Right, There's right. going to be a point where someone else gets that ride. True. And you're there, but maybe not like you were there before. What was that experience? Like I asked Sebastian, because he's on that. Right. I said to him, actually on the show, I said, are you afraid it's going to go away? He goes, yeah. I'm afraid it's going to go away. And of course, he works his ass off to make sure that it doesn't. But in his case, and he would be the first one to say, there will be a point where it's not quite right. what it is. The now. zeitgeist moves on. And right. it's, yeah, there's like, you're always going to have your ability to create probably something new and exceptional, but like what it was will not remain. But it could be even better though, right? Sure. Like I think your work I think is it, better. I think it should be and it always will be if, if you're, you're putting yourself in the right maybe place. Maybe it's because I'm a different age, but your work impacts me on more levels now than just laughing before. Right, right, right. So, right. so, but what about this notion of, I think a lot of people tie their identity to just the external. I'm a mother. And so if their son hits three home runs in a game, they're real happy and proud. But if he's 0 for 3 or getting D's in school, they're not. Or I'm a, I, their money or their fame or their career or their body or their looks. Right. Right. Or and there's a danger, I think, in that. So did you have to did you did you have a little of that? And did you have to find your identity? And I know you see it in yeah. in, in, in Hollywood. Yeah. Hold yeah, out yeah. here a lot. Like there's a lot there's mainly 
their identity is tied to their notoriety or career. There, there was, yeah, there was, again, with no playbook, and there's nobody like, hi, I'm your liaison to fame. I'm going to help you. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm going to help you work through, like, yeah. the columns that you mm-hmm. want to, you know, keep strong and the things that, you know, you know are somewhat fabricated. Or maybe yeah. you're not ready, so you mm-hmm. fake it till you make it. I, I was, um, again, fortunate, maybe uh, had a great angel on my shoulder. When I first was um, putting myself out there on social media and seeing that it was working, I changed the banner of my first danecook.com page, which is still up today. And by the way, ab- above it all is on there. Um, Good. The first banner, I created like a um, little HTML code banner. It said, um, it said, if you're uh, interested in my comedy and career, um, I said, please don't follow me if you're not a fan of risks because I plan on taking a lot of them. And I gave myself permission right there yeah. to change and evolve and not be Johnny Bravo and put on the same facade or jacket. And I knew that also meant, oh, wow, you know, um, I'm, I'm letting people know that they're going to be able to call me out on that moment and be like, oh, you're changing. Mm. You're different now. Mm. And I did get a lot of that. Mm. And you know what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it any other way. It's mm. probably the best thing I could have done because where I didn't have the education of truly who I was or what it meant to be not in the public eye again, mm-hmm. full circle back to like who I really was, mm-hmm. that at least prepared me to go like, well, nobody's ever going to be able to say I'm a phony yeah. because even though I wasn't always ready for moments and even though I was like a uh, ragtag sometimes, mm-hmm. what you see is what you get. Yeah. It was the Johnny Carson. In between the jokes, you got to know who I really was. That's... And I'm proud that I got to do that. And I would, I would tell your listeners, like, if there's one thing that you want to always rely on is that you're going to look in the mirror every single morning and that's the judge jury that's that all the intel and information is already right there your whole day mm. is in the look you give yourself mm. you brush your teeth you look away i used to Me i'd too. look away once in a while i just said that 2 hours ago Me really yep. yeah do you, do you get up do you um gosh you're amazing do you smi- do you smile be- just for the sake of being awake and alive i do mm. you know remind myself you got to stay grateful got to have gratitude I'm a welfare kid out of Boston. I've had something, nothing, nothing again, something, it maybe again. But the the prospect of your day is delivered to you right in that moment of looking yourself in the mirror. That's it. So start with some affirmations. Or I still do. I learned it. I, I never had to go to A personally. I, I've never had a drink in my life, but I went, I attend a lot of meetings. I love them. There's a lot of truth in that room. Yeah. There's a lot of brave people in those rooms. Um, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference between them. I say it every day. Start your day off with that. I'm just looking at you like, what in the, bro, you're remarkable. Oh man. You don't, you're very, you're not great at that, by the way. I've watched you a couple times. You're remarkable. Like as a man, you're obviously very talented. You're very funny. You're remarkable. Like, you're literally right now, you're a performer and you are sitting here changing ma- millions of lives potentially. Oh here. man, I just want to make people feel good. Yeah, you- And yeah, sometimes yeah. like, you know, I know the feeling of not being able to breathe because you're like, I'm trapped. I'm trapped in this life where I don't know what my path is. And I know that feeling. And hopefully somebody can hear this and be like, I'm not trapped. Hmm. You know, I believe that the obstacles and the hurdles in our life are, we don't, they're not there because- you ran into them, I believe you went towards them because you know that's the exact thing you need to break down and get past. That's so good. I really believe that. And you know, I I, I gotta shout out my mom because we've talked a lot about my dad, but I really wanna say something that, a moment that resonated me. My mom took me to see E.T. when I was a kid. It was at Christmas time that E.T. came out. Took me to Fresh Pond Movie Theater (laughs) over off Route 2 near, uh, you know, Lanes and Games. (laughs) Yes. She took me over there. And we went Christmas shopping and she had like Christmas gifts for me and for us that she hid in the bags and put in the trunk. And then we went and saw E.T. And I loved it. I was like, uh, I was just mesmerized by Mm. this movie, right? Yeah. Of course. We we all were. But I didn't know what I was going into and the music and the the story and Elliot and this whole thing. And, And we left the theater and I wanted to talk about the movie because I was just so... Yeah, lost in it. And we sat, even though it was winter, we sat for a little in our bundled up coats outside at, on the stoop. And I remember it. I remember it. I can see it. I see how cold we were, but I was, 
you know, just on a little tangent. And we sat, and it was even a little wet from the melted snow. But we sat there, and she was answering questions. And I said, where is that? Pl- who made that? And Spielberg. And all these things I'm asking. And she's trying to help me to, like, well, it's a, you know, they make the movie, and they do this. And, you know, you got to write it. There's a writer. Well, we get up from this moment where I'm so filled with magic. Yeah. <laughs> and we walked over, and the car had been stolen with all the Christmas gifts in it. And my mom, with her phobia, went into a full-blown, one of the scariest, she had spent all the money that we didn't have on these on Christmas and then to take me to the movie. And she went into like a, a fit, and not in the funny way, like a fit. Mm. And we went from this thing of like enchanting entertainment to like being so sad and broken and it happened like that it went from mm. that moment and 10 steps later mm. and i think that defines everything even today i think everything in that moment was like that's life yeah. fun funny scary sad mm. b- tragedy mm. and then she made a joke on the way home somebody finally picked us up and she said something funny and she's i hope that jacket wasn't their size whoever stole it she said something and we mm. laughed and and man, it's like from my mom, that's all I ever wanted to get to in my career is a place where I could go, man, I hope I can just give information in a way that's either useful or funny. Gosh. And that's kind of, that's the guy that's sitting here right now. Yeah. Can I be useful and funny? And that, that tells the kid inside me with the little void and the, yeah. that's it. That makes me feel like, oh, wow, I can have moments where uh, little flex of my day where I feel like of purpose. Yeah. Can I answer it for you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I'm yeah, feeling it. Yeah, You're yeah, pre- yeah. Yeah, like the it's, synergy that we're creating yes, here. I feel like people insane. are listening, going, "I'd like to be a part of that." It's conversation. insane, I'd and like, you can. You, yeah, it's insane. You're the best storyteller, dude. You're the. You're, there's a special in you, no pun intended, that which we'll talk about last. But like. You're entering. I love watching someone step into like uh, their next level. Yeah. That's what you're doing. Yeah, I know. I'm feeling it. You feel it? You I are. feel good, man. Yeah, you're yeah. stepping in. I'm the your... happiest and healthiest I've ever been. Even when I look back on that kid in 04, 05, mm. there was a lot missing, a lot lacking. Yeah. And um, I'm happy to now be celebrating. Those fans have, again, growing up with it. The, now their kids, their families are enjoying this new special. Mm. And I'm almost enjoying that period of time. Now, not with haters and all the ambivalence, even though there's always a level of narrative. Yeah. But the reality is I get to you know, look back on that era fondly. And now I get to enter into this era smartly. Yeah. You know, there's a convergence of your um, talents and gifts with your life experience that are converging right now. I think so. That's what's happening. Feels and like- and as a, there's a, there's a part of your spirit that was always there that was going to be receiving this, that was preparing for this time. It's <laughs> like really obvious to me. It's kind of like I'm watching you. You watch my face a couple of times. My, Free on audio would know, but I can feel my sort of my jaw drop a couple times here. One of the, I want to ask you a business question. A couple things last. Are you betting on yourself in this special? Meaning, um, it's not streamed traditionally where it normally would be. Right. So, are you? Did you make a bet on you here, or how did this all work? Because this is another thing that would speak an awful lot to your vision, your courage. I was watching you going. I think this is a bet, maybe with some partners, but this is a bet. This this is you. Yeah, he's betting on himself here on this special. So tell him Fully. what that means and how that works. Because this is this is also another element of your vision. Because there's yeah. a few of you now that are like, you know what? I ain't putting it over there. Right. Maybe they do or don't want me. But either way, yeah, I'm going out on me here. So explain what you're doing here. Yeah, whether they do or it all. don't want me, um, I didn't even enter into those meetings. Well, in your case, questions. they'd want you, but some guys. Well, not everybody. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely like, hey, listen, this is there's always clicks and there's yeah. always places that you think, oh, I'm going to have access, and right. they're like, nah, we're good. Okay. Um, um, and then there's other places that are like dying to have your business. But for me, it wasn't even about entertaining those. It was about probably based on a lot of what I told you when I first moved into that house. Mm-hmm. I felt like I'm in a position now. I've earned back the ability to to gamble on myself. Mm-hmm. And so I invested my own you did, huh? money and I, I didn't do it halfway. If you watch this special, you're going to see drone shots. Unreal. You're going to see yep. um, uh, the guys who like the Super Bowl halftime show came and look like makes my house look like a, like a little Red Rocks, yeah. a little it amphitheater. Does. It's exactly the, what it looks like. It's beautiful. Yep. Um, and so the whole goal here was to 
I've always liked to be a little bit of a, a disruptor in business. You have. Because I don't like the way especially young artists get stuck in contracts and their IP becomes shared IP, which yeah. then really isn't. It's not theirs. <laughs> it's not IP anymore. Right, right. It's, it's something. It's a yep. hybrid. Yep. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of those situations, there's a big contract, and the first three pages are for you, and then there's like <laughs> 50 the others that are bad. for them. Yep. And so what does that really mean in the long short? It means um, – you spend a lot of time and and more money kind of chasing your own residuals that you've earned from what you've created. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I did it independently. I partnered up with Moment.co, okay. Scooter Braun's investment. And basically what he wanted to do is create like a modern pay-per-view, mm -hmm. but, for, but for internet. Mm -hmm. You can click on it. You don't need to subscribe to a streamer for a year. Mm -hmm. You can buy my special, enjoy it. And then at the end of that run that I have with Moment, uh, that contract ends everything reverts to me Comes back and, to and i get all the data which the streamers will not tell you i want to know regions i want to know analytics i want to know gender i want to know i, I want to know demo i want i want all that that helps me to understand my fan base as Biggest a business focus group in the world they yeah. won't tell you that yeah. okay you'll you, in fact you'll wait years to get your residuals and why does that happen to a lot of people that are not the Chappelle's and are not right. the segoras and at the right. highest level well, they get they get like a Brinks truck or something backed up for them, right. but everybody else is dealing with waiting for residuals that they may never get. And why are you waiting? It's because it's in the streamer's bank account. And guess who's getting the interest off That's that? That's right. Okay. Right. So for all those reasons, I say no. Good for you, brother. And I've put out something that I think is the best of me, and I'm taking a gamble. I'm taking a chance, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that people like yourself mm -hmm. see my spirit yeah. and are just very entertained because then I'll recoup. And yeah. if I recoup, then you're, I get to drum roll, invest in the next thing that I want to yeah. do my way yeah. and hopefully bring people something else that's pretty cool. So you guys got to hear that, right? It's above it all, staincook.com. And let me tell you guys something. It is, it's unbelievable. And by the way, for you entrepreneurs, you already just said, he just bet on himself. And it's really rare in this space that anyone's doing it. There's like a handful of you that are trying to do this right now. And in Dane's case, let me just say this because he won't say it to you. Number one, the, the, it, it, you feel like you only watch like 20 minutes because it flies by. It's an hour, but it's so good. Like, I found myself like, I actually wish it was longer. That's not a criticism. It just, that's how art should be, sure. right? But it like, zips. It, it's that good, right? So there's no, no lulls, number one. Number two, it's cutting edge. So it's visually stimulating too. It's not, you're not just watching a dude. The drone shots, I want to give it away. I just want people to see it. Sure. The drone shots, the staging, the lighting, even the little flick to your producer in the control room where you could yeah, see it. Like every little, Marty Colner, yeah, yeah, every little thing you did there, brother. I'm like, this is genius. Right well, here. somebody had said, I'm glad you brought up Marty because I do cut to Marty in the, in the sound booth. Yep. And the reason it was somebody said, well, you, you can't do that in a comedy special. I said, I don't want this to just feel like a comedy it special. Didn't. I want this to feel like maybe this is what a comedy special can be. Yeah. You know, this felt like an award show where they cut to the booth and there's yeah. the director directing the show. Yeah. And I'm on the screen behind him as Marty's like cheering. It really feels that you way. Know, for I got a to share, I got to put the legendary Marty Colner yeah. on camera. Yeah. And he managed to put me in the background on the TV. So I'm never not on oh, frame. Oh, you're right. You are there. Uh, it the, it are was there. a happy it's accident. Right there, like over his shoulder. You're we're right. having we're having a lot of fun with this. And you can, I, it comes through. Well, guys, there's several million of you. Go support it. Go Please. see this. It's, yes. it's, it's, it's real, guys. It's like, I, I'm just, that's why Dane's here. It's like, he's, he's obviously here to serve you. He served you for the last hour. Mm -hmm. If you go see this, you're you're serving him, but you're really serving your family because you're going to laugh and there's nothing in the content that I wish we could get into it because there's just some lessons even with the stalker story, but we're not going to go there right, right. now. The last <laughs> thing I want to say, um, I want to ask you about, because you did say it's the happiest you've ever been. You're in a relationship. The other thing you do, yeah, I don't know if you're willing to do it, but like you, you love. are, you, you're in love yeah, and but you poke fun at yourself too, dude, because <laughs> yeah. you're, you know, you, you well, every comic has to, you know, relationship humor yeah. is always in there and i've always had you know so much relationship stuff good and bad in my routines that i thought i need to talk about love i need I to talk think, about this relationship i think the hardest i laughed is the part where you said and if you want to tell a joke here because my to, girl just so we understand yeah. i still call my girlfriend yeah. my fiance we have an age difference there's an age difference yeah where have you been all my don't give away the don't don't give away the punchline. Right, no, well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's that's one best. of my favorite parts of the whole show. It's so I talk about Kelsey and I. And by the way, a lot of those jokes. The great thing about being with um, Kelsey is 
because people go like, does she like these jokes? I go, like these jokes? You should hear the jokes that she makes. Yeah. She has a savage sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And um, she's, you know, I knew she was the one. Okay. And uh, we're, I mean, it's it sounds goopy, but I'm just so happy, man, in my life. Good. Something I always wanted to contribute to the other side, which I felt like I'd, 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 uh, I got to visit a lot of rare air in my life, and I'm mm-hmm. grateful, but I never really felt like I had that right relationship that I'm like, this is something that I can put into my home life mm. that feels as gratifying just for me and this other person. So Good. I'm there. You deserve it. Thanks, man. And you've made a lot of other people happy in your life, and you deserve to be happy, brother. Thanks, bud. Thank you for doing this today. Oh, man, I hope let's part two it. This was really good. I would love to part two it. Yeah. This was really, we'll, really We'll do beautiful. it again in a couple months once it's been out for a bit, and okay. like we'll get some real great you know, feedback from people. Like, Let's see how it moved people. Okay. Guys, go support it. Go get above it all, danecook.com. And by the way, while you're doing it, go grab the power of one more of my book. Go to Nosy, see Change with Ed Milet, and support that show as well. You guys, go follow Dane as well. You can tell you're going to get not just laughing, but you're going to get life strategy and something that will move you as well. Everybody, thank you. Dane, thank you. Uh, Ed, grateful for you. Thank you. Share this with everybody, guys. God bless you. Max out. Max out.